Okay, this video is called, What is Unique About Genius? Understanding Genius Quotes and Concepts. And this comes out of several different things. Um, I'm gonna go through all these quotes and I'll give some little um, historical connections to this stuff. When I was in high school, I had a great life, really social, wonderful. I was an athlete, I was a great wrestler. I lived with my family, a wonderful family. I always had a really nice girlfriend almost all the time and really nice friends. And then I got injured and only Stanford still wanted me as an athlete and offered me a scholarship. And I didn't know anybody. I went out there thousands of miles from home and I was freaked out by the experience. The place is called the barn because it's in the middle of a field. There's no social activity. Um, I was so profoundly lonely for years. I didn't have a single girlfriend in four years at Stanford. That's what it was like. Um, and I was student athlete of the year at the place, okay? And well, in the beginning, it wasn't going so well. I was afraid I was gonna flunk out. I got injured in the sport. But I always had this idea and I was sort of, in some ways, sad and ashamed that I had screwed up my wrestling career after being injured and I wanted to redeem myself. So, you know, you can't really do anything when you're college or early grad school age because you don't know enough to do any creative work in a field or come up with anything new or interesting. But I always had that idea in my mind. Someday I want to try to become great at science or medicine. Um, and my father read all the time. I wanted to be like my dad. My mom didn't read much, but she was really funny and her family is real smart. Smarter than my dad's family, but all, they're more practical. You know, get a job, be a doctor, make money, support your family, have a good life. Um, so anyways, we'll go through some of these quotes and I'll ad lib the historical information behind them as we get to them. Um, to do easily what is difficult for others is the mark of talent. To do what is impossible for talent is the mark of genius. Henry Amiel. Okay, um, this is some stuff by Arthur Schopenhauer. He's one of the greatest philosophers uh, for genius psychology. He says, talent hits a target no one else can hit. Genius hits a target no one else can see. Talent works for money and fame. Genius works for motives less easy to determine. Scholars are those who have read in books, but thinkers, men of genius, world enlighteners, and reformers of mankind are those who have read directly in the book of the world. Intellect is a magnitude of intensity, depth of learning, not extensity, breadth of learning, which is why in this respect one man can confidently know more than a thousand. A thousand fools do not make one wise man. Arthur Schopenhauer, German philosopher. Okay, so that's also very much like what Galileo had said. You know, uh, he said intellect is like a horse race, and that's why, you know, one stallion can outrun, you know, a thousand plot horses. Okay, um, D.K. Simonton had written a lot about uh, geniuses. He wrote a book, Origins of Genius. So here's one of his first quotes. A genius is someone who transforms their field. And I think that's a good definition. Somebody who's done something that changes how... Uh, a field is practiced, and that takes obviously a tremendous achievement to be able to do that. Here's another quote from uh, D.K. Simonton. Nearly all eminent people were voracious readers. That's a key point, voracious readers. And Arthur Schopenhauer will tell you, the reason why smart people read all the time is because that's where all the information is. Um, and I can also tell you, you know, I was socially awkward after having spent so much time studying through uh, college, med school, and even a lot of residency. And I'll just tell you, like a typical experience, like I ran to with my wife, with my wife. You know, I would walk around in circles reading, you know, for exercise when I had nothing else to do and just because I wanted to read the book and why not, why not exercise while I'm reading? It increases your attention. And so my wife would get pissed off at me. She knocked the book out of my hands and she says, why the fuck do you read so much? What is wrong with you? Life isn't in a goddamn book. And it's like, she couldn't understand me. It was like, there was no way to communicate. Well, <laughs> this is where the information is. I want to learn. That's why I read. Um, and to her, it was like, you know, why are you wasting your time? You know, you could go out, be, get a moonlighting job, make money for this family. Instead of just reading these books about all these varieties of subject, what is wrong with you? She kind of thought I was strange. And I think in Polish culture too, I'm always Polish, it's sort of like a high level man is sort of like a contractor who can fix everything in the house, repair everything. He's skilled at doing everything to do with, you know, you can imagine in a house. All right. Versus, you know, I didn't learn much about that sort of thing. Um, and so my wife thought I was kind of odd. I also think there's a real thing, the Hollingworth gap, which means he called it the communication range. Hollingsworth was a psychiatrist who studied people of very high IQ. And she said, if there's a more than 30 points verbal difference in IQ or academics, she says, it's often a little bit difficult for people to talk to each other. The less, you know, academic person tends to think the other one is a real strange nerd autistic, weird person, and the really smart person tends to think the other person's kind of boring. 
Um, and I can certainly say between my wife and I, you know, when we talked about the kids or what we want to do for the house, you know, we had common ground. But when we got outside of that, there wasn't a whole lot of common ground. Um, okay, so here's some quotes from Aristotle. It's like one of the smartest guys of all time. The greatest thing is to be a master of metaphor. It is the mark of a genius to make good metaphors. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. When you read a really good writer, they surprise you with great metaphors. I mean, it comes out of nowhere and you sense that it's correct and it's useful and then you recognize this is this is a great thinker or writer. So Aristotle, as usual, Aristotle's right. Okay, Aristotle goes on. Great geniuses always have some touch of madness and sort of the classic mad genius would be Hamlet, of course. Okay, Arthur Kostler had a few good uh, quotes on this. He says, the real achievement in discoveries is seen in an analogy where no one saw it before. Okay, and a lot of times that's the case is that to see something new, you often have to overcome the obstacles of conventional thinking. And that's why in retrospect, when a genius discovers something new, it seems obvious, but it wasn't obvious before because of all the obstacles put in place by conventional thinking. Okay, Mozart. True genius is more than lofty intelligence and imagination. Love, love, love. That is the soul of genius. And where this comes from, of course, is you have to immerse yourself in it. And Goethe had said, you know, Johann von Wolfgang Goethe had said that in order to learn a complex subject, a man must love it. Because you got to spend a lot of time. You have to go through all the, you know, initially there's a rapid improvement phase. It's exciting and you're dreaming of all the wonderful things you can do in this new field. Then you have this long, tedious plateau where you just have to crank through all the details, if you will. And then once you hit pretty good mastery of it, then you can start being creative with it. But you have to pay the price there. Okay, Goethe, the first and last thing required of genius is the love of truth. Okay, John Malloy, he wrote a book called How to Work the Competition into the Ground and Have Fun Doing It. He also wrote How to Dress for Success. And he says, highly creative people are logical, pragmatic, nonconformists. They have learned they are not going to be understood. And I went through that phase where I sort of found it was really awkward for me to talk to people. And then I realized that no one, literally no one, even very, very few doctors were interested in talking about anything scientific or medical or technical but they wanted they love jokes so i i started memorizing all these joke books and comedy routines as a way to have something to talk about with people and people like that so uh but i kind of learned no one really gives a rat's ass about most of this complex science stuff but you have to care about it if you want to get good at it and i did okay understanding genius quotes and comments okay we're on the second page here in summary, the present survey of biographical information on a sample of 20 men of genius, including John Stuart Mill, Goethe, Pascal, Coleridge, and Voltaire, suggests the typical development pattern is something like this. Number one, they have a high degree of attention focused on them by their parents and perhaps by another adult, a teacher, a coach, a mentor. And it's expressed in an intensive education efforts and usually abundant love from at least one of the parents. Okay, um... I got love from my mother and I got an academic environment from my father. Don't get me wrong, I love my dad, he loved me, but, you know, it was like I talked to my dad about academic stuff, I talked to my mom about social stuff. Isolation from other children. Yeah, I think one of the biggest mistakes parents make is having their kids spend too much time with other kids. Other children the same age really sort of drag a child down because... They all want to do the same thing. None of them knows any more than the other kid. And Ayn Rand wrote a great essay about this called Compra Chicos. And she talked about how children need to spend time with their parents or some older siblings or, or who will give them good guidance. That's how they learn. Um, also, sometimes being alone becomes good for you because when you're alone, you have to learn how to entertain yourself. And quite often, reading books is part of that. Or, you know, if you're mechanical, you know, putting a machine together, taking a machine apart, figuring out how to put it back together. And you have to spend a lot of time in thought. And so I hated being lonely in uh, college and med school, but I got very good at being able to plan out a routine of, you know, 12 or more hours of studying in a day. And it was just became natural for me to read 12 hours in a day. And I noticed that like my friends that had stayed in a social environment, like never left home to go to college, you know, they would have a hard time studying five hours in a day. And there'd always be, you know, getting off into something, going to a party or being with their girlfriend or something. I had long, long term girlfriends, long distance girlfriends here and there, but I had plenty of time being lonely, which was very different from my high school life. If I knew then what I know now, I would have flunked senior year of high school three times in a row. It was so much more fun than my college and med school life um, in terms of the social component of it. Okay, um, they have a rich efflorescence of fantasy as a reaction to preceding conditions. Yeah, you'll read about that when you read about 
men who later on did great things academically, they often went through a period where they spent years just reading and reading and reading and studying. And that later on gave them a, a foundation from which they could build a lot. You know, John Ruskin was like that, sort of in the Victorian age renaissance in England. Uh, he was kind of an interesting guy. And he's a little crazy too. Almost all the geniuses have a, a, a crazy side to them. Um, and basically, if you if you get rid of the crazy side to them, you have no genius. I mean, look at, you know, uh, Isaac Newton. Okay, he spent more time writing about the Bible than he did doing his scientific work. Um, and he was actually a heretic by the definition of his day. Okay, so here's Harold McCurdy continuing on geniuses. He says, the mass education of our public school system has the effect of reducing all three of these components to a minimum. Accordingly, it should tend to suppress the occurrence of genius. Yeah, so basically, public school is designed to prevent genius. It wants everybody conformist and predictable. Okay, Bertrand Russell speaks now. He says, something of hermit's temper is an essential element in many forms of excellence, since it enables men to resist the lure of popularity to pursue important work in spite of general indifference or hostility and arrive at opinions which are opposed to prevalent errors. So yeah, like a public school, public school environment teaches everybody to think the same, to accept whatever who's the local authority in the matter, versus when you spend a lot of time reading and thinking and read all these old books and geniuses from the past, you start to think in a very unique way that's unpredictable, and that enables you to be a lot more creative and to come up with new ideas. Okay, um, it's also good to look at historical times when there were lots of geniuses, like Periclean in Athens, for example, and Renaissance Italy, and sort of like ask yourself, what happened? What was going on at that time? Okay, here's a little bit from Thomas Huxley, the English guy, you know, around the time of Darwin. He said, sit down before fact as a little child and be prepared to give up every preconceived notion. Follow humbly whatever and to whatever abysses and to wherever uh, nature leads you, or you will learn nothing. The improver of natural knowledge refuses to acknowledge authority as such. For him, skepticism is the highest of duties. Blind faith, faith is the one unpardonable sin. Every great advance in knowledge has involved the absolute rejection of authority. The most effective method of clearing up one's mind on any subject is talking it over with men of real power and grasp who have considered it from a totally different point of view. Yeah, I, I would agree with a lot of things that he said there, is that most of the authorities are fake, uh, and most of the stuff in conventional thinking is actually not true. And I've mentioned this before, but, you know, like when I was in med school, I was like first in my class of 333 students, and I read the pathology book. It came out of Harvard primarily, and I was like in awe of it, okay? I um, I thought, this is real medicine. This is the, the truth, you know, the the gospel truth of, of pathology, understanding disease. And now that I'm older, I look at that book as a joke, like a comic book on almost all the major diseases. It's, for, it's like completely wrong on the important things. It, it, it's an absolute joke. Um, but, I, but I'm saying is that's, so when you're young, you're just sort of memorizing stuff. It's really like a memorization contest, college and grad school. But when you're older and you're trying to really understand something, uh, then it's, you know, understanding. It's not memorization. Okay, um, also one thing, not just to brag, but, you know, on my residency board, it's only the top 15% can get into radiology. It's like a four, four and a half hour test. I was done in an hour and 10 minutes with a perfect score. I just say that to say that I got pretty good at school. I, and that was really memorization at that point, but I was in this for, for keeps. I mean, I had nothing else to do. And I really wished I was an athlete and a wrestler and a wrestling coach, but I was going to try to do something in academics and I couldn't find a good research thing. So I became fascinated with you know, cognitive skill and academics and, and test taking and memorization and stuff. Okay, Alfred North Whitehead. Fundamental progress has to do with reinterpretation of basic ideas. A clash of doctrines is not a disaster, it's an opportunity. And that's actually where you get in trouble in medicine is that if you're going to make progress, you have to think of things in a new way. And if you have to think of things in a new way, that means you're very typically refuting or rejecting the conventional way. But the problem with that, the reason it gets you in trouble in medicine and in a lot of areas of science is there's a lot of people making money off the conventional way. And when you come up with a better way, they get pissed off at you. They could even hate you or do nasty things to you. Like a lot of scientists, when they come up with a big discovery, they don't get promoted. They get fired, okay? And it's like that in medicine, too. It can be very scary. There's certain things that you know are true, but you won't say them because you know you will get in trouble. Um, and then you start to realize it's very different than sports. In sports, the goal is to be a better performer and your team to perform better and to win the athlete, the fans, the coach, everybody's in agreement on that. But in medicine, 
You can't understand modern healthcare and medicine unless you focus primarily on money. Helping the patient, yeah, that's nice, but it better not get in the way of making money. And so when a scientist comes out there sort of pure of heart trying to figure out how to help a patient more and he contradicts something that's a big money maker, he's, he can get himself in big trouble real fast. Okay, so now a little more of Arthur Schopenhauer. Again, he's from the 1700s, 1800s. He says, <clears throat> a great intellect sinks to ordinary when it is interrupted and distracted because its superiority depends on the power of focusing all of its strength on one theme. Always to see the general <clears throat> in the particular is the foundation of genius. Intellect is invisible to the man who has none. Okay, so the point about this is geniuses hate noise because if they're trying to concentrate on something, then the noise distracts them and they really can't concentrate effectively and it pisses them off. Okay, and that's also why, to me, I think anybody who's serious about being smart, you're not going to like beat music. Yeah, it's fun to dance to, maybe it's fun to lift weights to, but I think part of being brilliant is constantly, you know, not always, but very often having an idea in your head and, you know, thinking of that idea and trying to see it from different ways. And so, you know, loud noises, they just move that idea out of your head. So I'm, what I'm basically sort of saying is if you find yourself <clears throat> in your car listening to beat music instead of listening to an audio book, then you're really not helping your intellect, okay? You know, don't worry about what everyone else does. What everyone else does, 99.9% .9 of people, they, they don't care. I mean, I don't know if that percentage is correct, but most people, it's, it's weird to me, your brain is a gift. They don't care about developing the brain. I know that because I hang out with tons of doctors and most of them don't read anything and never talk about anything intellectual. They're very nice. Many of them have very high IQs. I know plenty of doctors who often understand things faster than I do, but they don't have that curiosity. They're not curious about reading, okay? Um, and you have to read a lot if you want to keep accumulating more information and being able to move to a higher level of knowledge about something. Okay, here's a quote from uh, Helvetius, Claude Helvetius, Helvetius. Genius comes from sustained attention. It is the strong passions which impart to us that continuous earnest attention necessary for great intellectual efforts. Yeah, you have to be fascinated by something to want to really understand it because it's going to take a lot of time and there's going to be no reward for it most of the time, especially in the early or the middle level phases. Charles Darwin, even people who aren't geniuses can outthink the rest of mankind if they develop certain thinking habits. Yeah, and basically the same thing with study skills. All these kids go to college and they don't have any study skills. It's pathetic. You know, you might as well, college is just memorization. You might as well train yourself in memorization skills. And you learn to study skills, it's like raising your IQ 30, 40 points. Um, stupid to pay all that tuition and not know how to study. Everybody thinks they know how to study. Well, you know what? You don't really know how to think. You don't really know how to study well until you've really been in a competitive environment. You know, Stanford, like average pre-meds, like a 99.5% academic SAT test or something. So, you know, you have to do A plus work just to get a, you know, to get a B plus or something. Anyways, okay. Uh, books are the legacies that genius leave to mankind. Joseph Addison. Okay, Charles Bukowski. Here he has a quote. Genius might be the ability to say a profound thing in a simple way. Almost everyone is born a genius and, burnt and buried an idiot. So yeah, a lot of the most brilliant things, they sound simple, but it took a lot of learning and thinking to come up with them. Okay, also almost everyone's born a genius and buried an idiot. And that's been observed by a lot of people that lots of children show a lot of intellectual uh, potential when they're young. And for whatever the reason, they get sidetracked. Most of the time it's social. You know, I think every kid's IQ drops about 30 points when they get a cell phone. That was another argument with my wife. She wanted to give the kids a cell phone when they were, I don't know what grade, sixth grade or something. And I'm like, no, no, no. You know, I, I somehow got through all of my uh, childhood, my teen years and my early adulthood without a cell phone. Um, once they get a cell phone, all they want to do is talk to their friends. Their friends are all the same age and then they only talk about social stuff and they become dumb. I've seen that where they'll stop reading, they'll try to sleep with the phone next to their head. You know, they're getting EMF'd and microwave their brain all night if they do that. And you, anyways. Cell phones are very overrated. Okay. okay, this is now by Santiago Ramon y Cajal. He's the guy who came up with all the magnificent drawings of the neuronal anatomy. Every great work is the fruit of patience, perseverance, and concentration during months and years upon one specific subject. He who wants to discover a new truth must be capable of the strictest abstinence and renunciation. 
The ideal case would be that of a scientist who during this period of mental incubation would pay no heed to any thought that is extraneous to his problem if he possesses this capacity to remain incessantly absorbed by one subject he will be able to multiply his strength okay yeah and i know that's true like if i'm trying to really understand something like i was fascinated by diabetes for a while i wouldn't want to read about anything else i wouldn't want to think about anything else i would just be absorbed with it um, and that absorption is part of learning. And then what you want to do too is have conversations with other people, try to find an expert who might know more than you about it, read from a variety of points of view. I'll read a book by a patient. I'll read a book by a diabetes researcher, one by a non-diabetes researcher, and all these different points of view. Then you start to get bigger insights. Okay, now here's a book about the genius famine. Okay, they're talking about the personality of a genius. Geniuses have an endogenous personality with innate high ability, inner motivation, and intuitive thinking. Endogenous personalities are usually socially awkward at best. He stays focused on a problem longer than most men. For him, solving his problem is an end in itself. It is what he most wants to do. The highly able endogenous personality is the archetypal genius, the creator of original innovations that are vital to civilization itself. We have a genius famine, partly because intelligence is in the decline in the West, partly because social institutions no longer recognize or nurture genius, and partly because the modern West is hostile to genius. Yeah, think about that for a doctor, okay? I know some doctors with really high IQs, all right? They do their job, they make their money, they go home, enjoy their life. Now, why in the world would they ever want to make a discovery? If you make a discovery, you piss people off. You potentially will get fired from your job. You'll potentially make enemies. So what I'm trying to say is if you actually try to do what a genius should try to do is maximize knowledge and try to understand things in a new and better way, you risk losing your job and getting in big trouble, okay? And who knows what else? So what I'm trying to say is there's zero incentive to do genius work. Most of the people you hear about being genius are all fake, okay? Somebody will come up with a new drug with a 5% improvement in one area and it's going to have 10% side effect in another area and they're going to get proclaimed a genius because they're making money for a company, okay? But they're not really geniuses. Most of the academic big shots I met in my career were fakes. They had these big long resumes from just being affiliated with a place that published a lot of paper. And don't get me wrong, I met some real geniuses, guys who are doing really great things and women too, but... You could usually see it came from inside them. They sort of had this, you know, passionate love of what they were doing, and it just projected in the thoroughness of their work and the beauty of it, okay? Like Ann Osborne, the Mormon lady who wrote the great neuroradiology text. She was a very heroic genius woman. I really liked her. Um, and I've seen some other guys, you know, they're a little crazy and maybe even a little cold, but man, are they smart. And I like those guys, you call them the, you know, the, the sage on the stage. There were some great teachers. Usually they were older guys who really knew their field well. And they were very idiosyncratic and cantankerous. And in the modern world, a lot of those guys would be fired because they would be kind of a little bit nasty and mean. And uh, nowadays, you, that's probably not going to be put up with. But back in the day, that was common amongst a lot of these old-time guys that were really bright. And... Um, and it's just how it was. There weren't that many women in medicine. Like when I was young, when I did my fellowship at Harvard, there was a vascular surgery attending. I still remember. His name was Michael Belkin. And I think his wife was a radiologist. And he didn't like the interventional radiologist, imaging guided surgeons, because he felt we were stealing his cases, doing the angioplasties instead of his surgical bypass. And I remember he puffed up his chest and like stood right in my face like he was going to kick my ass. And I just laughed at him. You know, I was a really good wrestler. I could have choked him out in two seconds, okay? But just the attitude that he would stick his chest out in my face and act like he's going to beat me up and try to intimidate me because he felt we were stealing his case. That was the mentality back in those days. Um, anyways. All right, so getting back to this article about uh, the, the personality of a genius. It says, the brain of a genius is differently wired from a normal brain. It is specialized. Some circuits usually used for social intelligence and reproductive success are co-opted to serving a creative purpose. And I think that's true. Instead of putting their energy and time into a social life, they're putting it into their academic aspirations. And this is why personality and intelligence go together in a genius. Something deep within the genius makes him want to fully comprehend, improve, or express the nature of reality. 
pursuing this quest is the destiny of the genius. It is what he is meant to do. And I met a guy at Stanford named Jay Ream, who was like, got all A pluses in physics, calculus, biology. This guy was so smart. And then you talk to him, he had almost like no aspiration. He was just fascinated. He just thought everything was so interesting. And he actually taught me a lot about study skills. I became a much better student after hanging around with him. Um, I started getting A pluses in the science classes at Stanford from hanging around with him, but I knew he was beyond me at that time in science. Um, and uh, he was really good for me to hang around with him. But that's actually, I think, was a, one of his weaknesses. He couldn't focus on one thing. So he's a genius guy, but he couldn't focus on one thing. And you got to put a lot of energy into one thing to get great at it. Um, but anyways, he had a very positive effect on me. Pursuing this quest is what he's meant to do. Newton's ability, intellectual abilities, intelligence was obviously stratospheric. Newton as a child and as a young man of science would spend nearly all of his time alone. Yeah, his father died and then his mother left him to live with like his grandparents while she ran off with some guy. And so Newton was very alone and his grandparents like tried to make him into a farmer and he wasn't a farmer. And luckily he got in like as a servant into Oxford College and then he started to blossom his intellect. Um, when Newton was asked how he made discoveries, he said, by thinking on it continually, I keep the subjects constantly before me, like for discovering gravity. And that's pretty much like what Einstein said, the same thing. They're just fascinated with an idea, so they obsess over it and look at it from every different perspective. Carl Jung had a long-term live-in mistress who functioned as a second wife. Only an inner-orientated personality can be sufficiently independent of the social consensus to be able to change the social consensus. Okay. Yeah, I thought that was rather... I, did, I actually found uh, Carl Jung to be a little bit obscure. I read a lot of his stuff. I didn't think he was kind of a lousy writer. He had some good ideas. But then I'm like, wow, you could convince your wife to let you have an apartment in your backyard and have a mistress living there with you. The guy must be a genius. Okay, uh, here's a quote from W.H. Auden. Geniuses are the luckiest of mortals because they what they must do is the same as what they most want to do. Yeah, I think if somebody really knows they're onto something, they're excited about it. You know, it's like there was a wrestler, John Smith, six-time world champion, and he talked about when he was developing his new technique, like a low single leg that he felt like he was, you know, discovering the cure for cancer and he was so obsessed with it. And I've talked to other, you know, great athletes and great scholars and that's a normal thing, you know. You, you can't be great at something usually unless you're obsessed with it. Okay, Calvin Coolidge. Nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a cliche. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. And you'll often see that in some scientists who makes a great breakthrough. They just were like a, a maniac, you know, in, in the effort they put into coming up with their discovery. Thomas Edison, genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. A lot of hard work. You know, a lot of people say he ripped off Tesla, but he also had a lot of other great researchers with him and he came up with a lot of great stuff. Okay, Thomas Fuller, here's a good quote. The real difference between men is energy. A strong will with a settled purpose and invincible determination can accomplish almost anything. And this is a distinction between great and little men. Matthew Arnold, genius is mainly an affair of energy. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. You know, there was a quote by uh, Musk. He said that, you know, if you're working 10 hours a day and the other person's only working five hours a day, you're going to get there a lot faster than they are, even if you both have the same ability and the same methods. Um, here's Ian Fleming, the guy who wrote all the James Bond books and uh, movies. All the greatest men are maniacs. They are possessed by a mania which drives them forward towards their goal. The great scientists, philosophers, religious leaders, all maniacs. What else but a blind singleness of purpose could have kept them in the groove of their, their cause? Mania is as priceless as genius. And I would say that's true because I know some like world champion wrestlers, Dave Schultz, Mark Schultz, they were just obsessed. They were like fanatical about becoming better at wrestling. And I know some great scholars and they too are quite obsessed with it. And I think that's what it takes to be really great. You know, you got to figure out some way to balance your social life or you're going to end up lonely and miserable. But um, if you're, you have to be obsessed with your work, that's why I think you end up, you have to simplify your life. You can only focus on a few things so that you don't waste time on anything else. That's, I believe, what it takes to be really great, you know, if that's what you want. 
Okay, Jacques Barsoon, the French historian and writer, the history of creation is but a succession of battles between genius amateurs, inspired heretics, and orthodox professionals. So usually the genius is like a nobody, has no connections or anything. Um, he's considered a heretic. And then the orthodox professionals a lot of times are the establishment and they're making money for some company or some rich person. And so all the perks are on their side. And they will usually block the new ideas as much as they can. Um, I was kind of shocked by that because, you know, you read the books, you know, in conversations with my dad. I'm thinking, you know, people are going to like it when a new great idea comes along. But I've learned the hard way. They do not. They certainly do not. Jacques Bersoon, formal education makes people biologically stupid. Oh, and what that kind of is, is some geniuses, they forget to have any kids. Like Newton didn't have any kids. I've seen a lot of female doctors forget to have kids, you know, and, and, and they're, they're nice. They're pretty. They just... For whatever the reason, who knows what it is, they uh, end up not ever having kids. Some of them don't even ever get married. And you're like shocked by it. Um, one is not born a genius. One becomes a genius. Simone de Beauvoir. She says, the individuals who seem to us most outstanding, who are honored with the name of genius, are those who would propose to enact the fate of all, their human of all humanity in their personal existences. Okay, yeah, well, if a genius does something that helps all mankind, then that's a higher level genius, Okay. Here's Bernard Berenson, an art critic from the 1800s. He says, genius is the capacity for productive re reaction against one's training. That is very, very rare. Um, and so I think that is a sign of genius. It's You'll almost never see somebody who can uh, completely go against how they were trained um, and, and, and see a better way of doing it. It's like, look at medicine. It's sort of based on a paradigm of most things uh, revolve around drugs. Um Matt's yield to the pill and send the bill. But then when you start to really, really study disease, you realize it's mostly due to diet and toxicology. And drugs are a minor component of health. Um, okay, George Box from the 1900s, he said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. He continues, just as the ability to devise simple but evocative models is a signature of a great scientist, so over-elaboration and over-parameterization is often the mark of mediocrity. And that is totally true. If you pick up a medical journal, what in my experience, let's say there's 40 articles in there, 39 of them, oh, 38 of them are going to be crap. Tons of statistics and all this stuff, but no useful information, just tedious crap. And then there might be one good article and one so-so article. You'd be amazed how crappy most of these journals are. They're, they're usually owned by some company who's just trying to promote its products or something. Or they're trying to just make money off drug advertisements. So it, it's shocking how bad medical journals tend to be. Okay, um, Arthur Schopenhauer says, too many, to use many words communicates few thoughts. To use many words that communicate few thoughts is the unmistakable sign of mediocrity. To gather much thought into few words stamps the man of genius. So he's good on learning how to write, too. And so basically, every time you write, even just a note to your friend, <clears throat> if you want to become good at writing, say to yourself, how could I phrase this better? How could I phrase this more concisely? Because if you want to get good at communicating and writing, you have to put some thought into it. And putting thought into all the little parts of your day helps you to improve those things, and you get better and better. Okay, Ch Lord Chesterfield from 1600s, 1700s, you know, basically says the same thing. Steady attention to one's object is a sure marker of a superior genius. Okay, Kenneth Clark, he was a great art historian. He says, I believe in the God-given genius of certain individuals, and I value a society that makes their existence possible. Yeah, I think that's true. And that's been said, too, um, about, for example, the ancient Greeks. Why were the ancient Greeks so great? And the reason is because they allowed people to have opinions. Don't get me wrong. The ancient Greeks did plenty of stuff that was bad. Okay, they had slavery, which was bad, and they were terrible in Milos and a few other things. But man, they had the great playwrights, you know, Aeschylus, Euripides, Sophocles, Aristophanes, the great historians like Thucydides, the great philosophers from Pythagoras to Socrates to Plato to Aristotle. Incredible. So they had a society where you could have an opinion. And I think the reason was the Greek city-states, <clears throat> many of them were you know, far apart enough or on little islands or separated by mountains, So, and they traded with other cultures, and all of that enabled them to maintain some uniqueness in their different communities. In most other countries of the world, you would have a tyrant that would just conquer this big flat landmass and then force everyone to obey the same rules, and no one was allowed to do anything new, interesting, different, or creative. 
Um, so you'll look, you know, like in ancient Egypt, you know, you'll have a thousand years go by and nothing new happens in art because everyone is forced to make their art the same way <clears throat> as what is forced upon them by the, the Egyptian priest of that time or priest equivalent, whatever. Okay, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, he's a great writer. Uh, that was a great poet around the same time as Wordsworth in um, England. You know, they together wrote lyrical ballads, real famous. All right, so he says, People of humor are always in some degree people of genius. Uh, no mind is thoroughly well organized that is deficient in a sense of humor. And I think that's a good statement. In my experience, most of the true geniuses, guys that were just really brilliant or brilliant women too, like Ann Osborne, they were nice. They had a sense of humor. They were human. They were fun. They were pleasant. They would enjoy a joke. Versus all the fakes, most of the fakes that I saw, the fakes never joked around. Like I see these guys, they'll have, you know, hundreds of publications and then you hear that they're going to give a lecture. So you go there expecting something interesting and they say nothing but boring platitudes and all these safe little wimpy statements. Don't get me wrong, that can be a good way to go through academic and help you get promoted as a safe, predictable person. But they never discover anything. And in my opinion, most of them suck and they're phonies and... Believe me, I know tons of them. Okay, um, versus somebody who's funny, you know, cheers everybody up having somebody funny around. And I've even had people who are funny and they insulted me a lot, but I liked them because they made me laugh. Like I can tell you this, when I did my residency, I was at Northwestern and one of the attendings said to me, oh, our first Puerto Rican. I'm going to have to make sure the, the hubcaps are tightly secured to my car. And I just laughed because I knew I knew I was going to be the best resident in the whole program. I just laughed. I thought it was funny. And he would always make fun of me. But I, I actually liked being around him because he was real smart and he taught me a lot of stuff. And so I, 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 anybody who makes me laugh, you know, brighten my day. I got so much work I always have to do. I love it when somebody makes me laugh. And if somebody wants to tease me, good, I'll tease him back. I, I found him kind of a fun attending. Okay, um, here's a quote, James Conant, uh, 1890s and 1900s. He says, there's only one proven method of assisting the advancement of pure science, the picking of men of genius, backing them heavily, and leaving them to direct themselves. Um, one of the things I would say is if, if guys are, or, or people are really interested in a subject, they're just going to gravitate towards understanding. I know I got some real smart doctor friends, and we'll look at a complex brain and it's just a fun game for us. We'll sit there and we'll talk about it. We'll talk about our previous experience and figure out a lot of tough cases through those conversations. They're really valuable to have somebody else who's an expert in your field that you like talking to and who wants to explore the complexities of the field with you. Okay, this Roger Shank guy is a computer programmer, a real smart guy, and he, <clears throat> he wrote some good books on, on learning and education. Here's one of his quotes. We learn by doing, by mutual story exchange and conversation. When we have a goal, something we are trying to accomplish, when we have peers and mentors with whom we can discuss. And <clears throat> the other thing too is, and I know I've learned this, is whenever you <clears throat> come up with a new observation, like you figure something out, you want to pick up the phone and call your friend and talk about it. Or, or if you have a friend, you know, you're lucky that you can talk to about it. Because it sort of like crystallizes it in your mind. You know, like I'll, I'll be trying to understand some complex thing of disease. For example, I'm looking at these brains. I'm seeing all these intracranial bleeds, microbleeds, And I'm thinking, gosh, you know, I really can't see much difference between hypertensive encephalopathy and this uh, cerebral amyloid angiopathy, for example. Nor can I think of much of a difference in what it looks like in the eye. So then I sort of realize they're kind of the same thing. And, and that's how you have big observations. And I'll call my friend, I'll call an opto friend, and we'll say, and you'll, and you'll figure out the disease. That's where it comes from. Clinical observations that confuse you, that don't seem right, that contradict the books, and then talk to a few experts with real experience, and then you can figure out a lot of stuff. Okay, um, here's another quote now from Henry Fielding, the English novelist. There is a sort of knowledge, knowledge beyond the power of learning to bestow that is to be had in conversation. So necessary is this understanding to the characters of men that none are more ignorant of them than those learned pedants whose lives have been entirely consumed in colleges and among books. For however exquisitely human nature may have been described by writers, the true practical system can only be learned in the world. Yep, helps to converse. And there's a genius guy named Johnny Von Neumann, and he noticed that his productivity dropped when he went away from the university environment because he no longer had colleagues to discuss stuff with. Okay, Mason Cooley quote here. Genius knows where the questions are hidden. And there's truth in that, that <clears throat> 
a genius can see a lot of times that an obvious basic question in the field is not being addressed and that most of the researchers are just sort of, you know, uh, spending all their time on trivialities. Okay, and T. Colin Campbell talks about that, how most nutrition research is all reductionism, but it's holism, if you will, where you really make the big discoveries that are useful. Okay, Mihawe Chikstamahawi, it's hard to say his name. He writes all about flow. He wrote all the books on flow. The unifying similarity amongst geniuses and innovators is motivational. They are interested in unique goals, different than the masses. And I think one point I would make about that is I noticed in medicine, a lot of my colleagues, they just wanted to pass their tests, and, you know, maybe do well to get into their residency or fellowship of choice, <clears throat> then get a job, make money, have a family. Okay, and that's great. You know, they wanted to do a good job, but they had no desire whatsoever to ever discover anything, to ever see anything in a deeper way, to ever use their intellect beyond the work of the day. Um, <clears throat> whereas I always had this idea, you know, I'm going to make up for ha having ruined my, my athletic career by getting injured, and I want to be great. And I don't know what it's going to be at, but, man, I would push myself till I would drop from exhaustion. Okay, Fyodor Dostoevsky. Inventors and men of genius have almost always been regarded as fools at the beginning and very often at the end of their careers. That's true too. Whenever you do things different than everyone else is doing them, <clears throat> you will get mocked and people will think you're crazy or you're a weirdo or you're a loser. And um, I ran into that sometimes when I would give a talk and I would give it in a non-conventional way because I was trying to explore something new. And I would get some of these looks from some of these attendings that, like, I wasn't as serious. I was as serious as he gets. I was just unconventional. Arthur Conan Doyle, skill is fine and genius is splendid, but the right contexts are more valuable than either. Yeah, that's true. If you got context, I've seen lots of people who are really pretty mediocre academically, but they were friends with the person who does the hiring or the promoting, and they got the big money. So it's it, it, it very much helps. I also see that in the nutrition business. All these nutrition docs, you know, are experts. And there's a lot of good ones, but there's a lot of phony ones out there. And there's certain topics that you really are expected to not talk about. And if you talk about them, you get shadow banned, okay? But on the other hand, if you want to be great, you got to go through the things that need to be talked about. You actually want to be an expert on all the controversial stuff. Okay, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle continues, Mediocrity knows nothing higher than itself, but talent instantly recognizes genius. Um, there's another quote we're going to come to it in a little while by Ogilvy, the advertising guy. He says, mediocrity often wants to destroy genius. I've kind of noticed that, like, if anybody wants to learn, they like me. Like um, a medical student, they love being around me or a young resident because they know I can teach them a ton of stuff real fast. And they can, you know, obtain over a year of learning in just an hour of hanging around with me. So they love being around me. And I also know really smart people, they like me too because we have fun conversations and we're very interesting to each other. But I do know I run into trouble sometimes if I get a guy who maybe has an IQ around 130 to 140 and he's used to being kind of smart in his local environment or context and for some reason he feels in, in competition with me, he'll, be, he'll first try to challenge me and then he's not even in my ballpark. And then after he realizes he's not even in my intellectual ballpark, then he'll start doing all kinds of passive aggressive nasty things to me. And I've learned the only thing I can do in that context is just avoid the person. But that is what it is. Okay, uh, here's quotes now from Will Durant, the historian from the early 1900s there especially. The real history of man is in lasting contributions made by geniuses to the sum of human civilization and culture. And it is so with every country. Its history is properly the history of its great men. I see history as a struggle of man through genius. I see men standing on the edge of knowledge and holding the light a little farther ahead. The Italian Renaissance had more geniuses than Periclean Athens. Consuming toil is the price of genius. Those artists who desire immortality for their work must pay for it with their personal lives. Yeah, you're going to have to put a lot of time into it. Um, and yeah, the Italian Renaissance was incredible. And that's because Rome also had money. So great talents from all over the world. They would go to Rome because that's where you could get a commission paid for your great artwork. And then they were all competition brings out genius too. All the great artists were competing. Who could make the best fresco painting or other type of oil painting, for example? And that competition brought out the best in them. Okay, here's an Albert Einstein quote. Intellectuals solve problems. Geniuses prevent them. Okay, Lauren Isley, science writer, has a quote from the 1900s. It is frequently the tragedy of the great artist, as it is of the great scientist, that he frightens the ordinary man. 
Subconsciously, the genius is feared as an image breaker. Frequently, he does not accept the opinions of the mass or man's opinion of himself. The great artist is known for his absolute unexpectedness. Some degree of withdrawal serves to nurture man's creative powers. The artist and the scientist bring out the dark void, the unique, the strange, the unexpected. Numerous observers have testified to the loneliness of this process. Yeah, and that's my experience too. When you become really great at stuff, a lot of times people in your own field, they get scared of you. I've had that experience dealing like, for example, this. I went to University of Illinois for medical school. They had something called the Hispanic Center of Excellence. Okay, it's like they're scared of me. I offered to come back free and give some lectures, you know. They're like, oh, no, no, no. And I know that a lot of times when something is mediocre, they don't want somebody really smart and good coming in because then they feel it makes them look bad, okay. I also had the experience, too, when I first wrote a book about study skills, I sent letters to over 100 high schools. I figured well, they're going to love to have me come there. I'll teach their kids how to memorize stuff. Their SAT scores, ACT test scores will go up. They're going to be so happy. Not a single one uh, invited me to speak at their high schools. It was all of them. I offered to do all this stuff for free. And then only three of them even said thank you. And I realized it's like these high school principals, they're not really there to help these kids. They're there to sort of like be like a warden to keep them in their place for their brainwashing lessons, okay? <laughs> You know, if you love somebody, you want to help them. You want to empower them. Um, it's ridiculous that the grade school and high school system in this country does not teach study skills. The colleges don't teach study skills. My first semester at Stanford, there's really actually it's on the quarter system. I was afraid I was going to flunk out, so I took a class in study skills. I didn't even have study skills at that time, and uh, it was actually quite helpful to me. Um, every kid needs study skill instruction. Okay. Um, here now we're going to talk about some quotes. These are by Ralph Waldo Emerson. He's from the 1800s. There are men too superior to be seen except by the few, as their notes are too high for the scale of most ears. Yeah, and Schopenhauer says uh, a great intellect lives like an eagle <laughs> far from society. And the point being is the farther somebody gets advanced into advanced intellectual work, the fewer people they can communicate their interest with. Okay, Fewer people that have either the expertise or the interest in that thing typically. The book, the college, the school of art, the institution of any kind, they stop with the past. This is good, they say. Let us hold by this. They pin me down. They look forward, not backward, but genius looks forward. Man hopes, genius creates. In every work of genius, we recognize our own rejected thoughts. They come back to us with a certain alienated majesty. To believe in your own thought, to believe that what is true for you in your private heart is true for all men. That is genius. In every work of genius, we recognize our own rejected thoughts. They come back to us with a certain alienated majesty. Okay, and actually I think that that's an important point there is. Part of becoming really smart, you have to trust yourself. Because all day long, most people are ignoramuses. Most experts are phony liars. And you learn that whatever you think is more likely right than what they're saying. Don't get me wrong, sometimes you're ignorant yourself on something, so you got to go read more and study about it, but you learn to trust yourself. That's a major step in becoming a um, high-level thinker. Okay, Ralph Waldo Emerson continues, Great works of art have no, no more affecting lesson for us than this. They teach us to abide by our own spontaneous impression with good-humored inflexibility, the most when the whole cry of voices on the other side. And then he also says, To be great is to be misunderstood. Yeah, the further you are beyond, you know, the more standard deviations you are beyond average in your field, the more people are not going to understand you. Okay, and that's actually part of being ahead of your time is that people don't understand you. That's to be taken for granted. Okay, Ralph Waldo Emerson continues, Talent says things which he has heard but once. Genius says things that he has never heard. Universities are, of course, hostile to geniuses who seeing and using ways of their own, they discredit the routine. Colleges hate geniuses, just as convents hate saints. So that was Ralph Waldo Emerson. Now here's John Stuart Mill. He was sort of a genius, not my favorite genius, but still a pretty brilliant guy from the 1800s in England. He said, persons of genius are a small minority, but in order to have them, it is necessary to preserve the soil in which they grow. Genius can only breathe freely in an atmosphere of freedom. The dre Okay, so that's good on Mill. He was good on that aspect. I didn't like the fact that he didn't want freedom for everyone else, for himself and his aristocrat buddies. Okay, William G. Sims. I'm not a big fan of English aristocrats, okay? My father's from Ireland, okay? And so I know what jerks they were to the Irish. 
and the other people that they had under colonization. William Sims, the dread of censure is the death of genius. Yeah, if, it's, if a genius is afraid they're going to be censored for whatever they say or write, they're not going to be able to write as creatively and as effectively. Okay, Northrop Fry, he wrote a great book about interpreting the Bible. It was awesome. That's my favorite thing Northrop Fry ever did. Okay, he wrote a quote, Only a great genius can answer the simplest questions in science and philosophy because it takes a great genius to become aware of them as questions. Yeah, they're able to see that the fundamental basic question has not been answered. You know, that's why McDougal's so great in nutrition. One sec, somebody, my kid's playing a radio. Hey, I'm trying to make a video. Turn it down. Turn it down. I'm making a video. Excuse me. I didn't want to end, though, and start over because this video's too long. All right? I'm already halfway there, so sorry about that. All right. Um, Stenhall. Geniuses. Oh, no. Buck, Buckminster Fuller. He's uh, you know, made the Buckyball and the Geodesic Dome. He said, geniuses are just people who had good mothers. Stenhall. The man of genius is he and he alone who finds such joy in his art that he will work at it come hell or high water. Yeah, that's another good example, too. Like, I had a friend in grad school. He was in law school. And, uh, you know, he said to me that, you know, oh, man, Saturday was rough. He studied five hours in a row. And I was, like, laughing. I'm like, wow, are you a wuss? I'll study five hours on a school night. On a, on a weekend, I would easily study ten hours. Okay? I mean, five hours is nothing. And I think the difference is I was very excited about what I was studying versus he considered it a pain in the body. He didn't want to do it. So if you're not, if you don't have your, your metaphysics, your values, your goals in line with what you're doing, then it becomes a lot more difficult. Okay? Um, it is a strong passions which impart to us the continuous earnest attention necessary for great intellectual efforts. Okay, Gary Kasparov, he's the world champion chess player from Russia. He said, the ability to work hard for days on end is a talent. The ability to keep on absorbing new information after many hours of study is a talent. Yeah. Great achievers, in my experience, or almost all of them, they're all workaholics. That's what it takes to, to become great. Okay, Johan Lavater says, who can produce more has vigor. Who can produce better quality has talent. Who can produce what no one else can has genius. Okay, then here's one from Eon Colfer. He said, genius inspires resentment, a sad fact of life. I gave a list here of a bunch of geniuses if you want to look at them. And so, you know, for this, I wanted to try to become a genius myself. Plus, I wanted to understand myself because, you know, I would I'd get called names, autistic and this and that. And I'm like, well, you know, what I came to realize was I'm just like anyone else that wants to be a genius. People who are trying to become top-notch level intellectually, academically, they're going to be reading all the time and they're going to seek out conversations with other people who are really knowledgeable in their area or knowledgeable in general for that intellectual stimulation of those types of questions, okay? And so I learned that, you know, the people who sort of don't understand me are just going to tease me about being autistic. It's simply because they don't have intellectual academic aspirations. And if you don't have those type of aspirations, then it seems weird to you. Why would somebody want to read so much? Um, okay, so Johann Wolfgang Goethe, he says, through practice, teaching, and reflection, success and failures, and again and again reflection, a man's mind unconsciously will link what he acquires with his innate gifts so that a unity results which will leave the world amazed. My most important task is to go on developing as much as possible whatever is and remains in me, distilling my own particular abilities again and again. Yeah, so Goethe was awesome. He's like the greatest German writer that ever lived. And you know, like one of my frustrations is I got to work five days a week so I, I can understand this pathophysiology stuff as well as anybody in the world, but I really don't have much time to do it. I wish I had more time. Because you look at some of these great thinkers and scientists of the past, a lot of them were wealthy. Or like, look at Ben Franklin, you know, I'm jealous of him. He got rich by the time he was 38 years old and he could devote all his time to science after that. I still got to work on most days. So I really don't have much time to read all these pathophysiology papers, but I find it fascinating to do so. I wish I had like some rich person that subsidized me and I could just study every day. That's what I want to do. You know, you could tell a person's personality. If you tell them you had a lot of money and you had three months in a row free time, what would you do? And I know a lot of the people I know, they would go to a tropical island, the Bahamas or something, have a lot of sunshine, visit their relatives, travel to their homeland country or their, their other relatives or something. And that would make them happy. What I would do is I would study every day <laughs> and try to write another book and then go try to meet the experts in those different fields. You know, that's what I would try to do. Um, and people say, well, why do you want to do that? Like, well, it's fun for me because I'm seeing things at, you know, a level like 
is up there with the best in the world. That's fun. Um, I don't really have much else to do. Um, so anyways, Eric Soto uh, from When Teaching Becomes Learning, that was a real good book. He wrote, the most eminent scientists and artists are people who see questions where most people see only the prevailing answers. In short, being creative is first a matter of discovering a question. Yeah, you have to recognize there's an important question to be answered and then pursue trying to, trying to answer it. Okay, Dave Trott from Predatory Thinking, he wrote, it gradually dawned on me what the creative geniuses all had in common. They had inquiring minds. That's what makes people creative. People who say, why does it have to be that way? That's true creativity. They had it coming off them like sparks. Yeah, they're able to question the fundamental premises, the fundamental assumptions. Most people never question the assumptions. They just say, that's how it is. That's how it is. Diabetes is always treated with a drug. Hypertension is always treated with a drug. They can't even imagine the idea of treating it with diet. Okay, William James. Genius means little more than the faculty of perceiving in an unhabitual way. Genius is the capacity for seeing relationships where lesser men see none. Arthur Kostler. The principal mark of genius is originality, the opening of new frontiers. Seeing an analogy where no one saw it before. Okay. Um, let's see. Talent works, genius creates. Good quote by Robert Schumann, composer. Okay, Goethe, the earlier a man becomes aware that there exists some craft, some art that can help him towards a heightening of his natural abilities, the happier he is. The best genius is that which absorbs everything within itself, knows how to appropriate everything, enhancing and improving them as throughout as much as possible. So I think that's one nice thing about learning how to draw. You can do it your whole life connected to other things. Great thing about being a musician, you can enjoy it your whole life. Um... Versus a lot of things. I love being a wrestler, but you know, you get older. Unless you wrestle every week, man, you don't have the you don't have the physical fitness uh, to do it, or you get injuries too, and you can't do it your whole life. Okay, uh, Franz Grillposer. Talent produces only fragments of beauty and originality. A genius integrates everything into a beautiful whole, and with its beauty and its originality. Yeah, they they have they're workaholics, so they can make it all stick together and be coherent. That takes a lot of time. Okay, like I said. You know, my wife saw me reading and trying to, you know, write a book chapter one time. She's like, why the heck do you waste all that time when you could be out moonlighting making real money? And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, right, then you'll divorce me. i got to pay you more alimony. No way. <laughs> no way. I saw a friend of mine. He was a doctor guy, real nice, smart guy. And uh, he got a second job moonlighting to make more money so that his family could buy a nicer house in a better neighborhood. And his wife was just bored. She felt neglected. She cheated on him. So he got divorced, and then he had to pay her like double alimony. And he's working the rest of his life like six, six and a half days a week. For me, that would be absolutely miserable. He actually is kind of autistic. I know him. I'm friends with him. And he doesn't, it doesn't bother him so much. It would bother me. Um, okay, here's a quote by Alfred Whitney Griswold about Hamlet. He said, could Hamlet have been written by a committee? Creative ideas do not spring from groups. They spring from individuals. The divine spark leaps from the finger of God to Adam. And I think that's a good point, too. Yeah, the best stuff comes from individuals. There's this idea nowadays they try to pretend, oh, this great research came from a giant lab with expensive equipment. Let me tell you something. Almost all that research, it's a bunch of fake crap. It never it does anything, okay? Look at the so-called war on cancer, you know, since back around 1970 and Nixon. They haven't done hardly anything, okay? Look at all these other medical fields, all this research. It's all BS. It's just drug companies trying to make money, all right? A lot of the great ideas. I've seen great ideas in radiology because, you know, some real geniuses of engineering have made better CAT scan machines, better MRI machines, better MRI sequences. I've seen geniuses, you know, in, in imaging-guided surgery come up with better ultrasound-guided techniques. Okay, anyways, uh, the world is only beginning to see the wealth of a nation consists more than anything else in the number of its superior men that it harbors. Geniuses are ferments when they come together as they have done in certain lands at certain times, the whole population seems to share the higher energy which they awaken. The effects are incalculable and often not easy to trace in detail, but they are pervasive and momentous. This is all William James, by the way. The more of our daily life we can hand over to automatism, which means get a machine or another person to do the busy work, the more of our higher powers will be set free for their own proper work. So now I think that's a good one. So what he's basically saying is if you can automate a lot of the busy work you have to do every day, then you got more time freed up for creative work. And that's one of the things I've been happy with with my wife is that she's quite happy to be like a secretary to me. And what that means is 
I don't do anything. She kind of moved out of our old house, and I was really sad about that because the old house, remember that when I told you about that one, I had the indoor basketball court, I had a backyard tennis court. I, I had all kinds of wonderful stuff that I built or had built there, and I loved the place. And she insisted on us moving, which really I was upset about. But what came out of it good was in the new house, which is her house. I went with her because I felt bad for the kids. I figured they needed me around. Um, is that she manages everything. And I think that's a real common with women. They're very proud of their house, and they pay attention to every detail. And the fact that it was her house instead of my house, and don't get me wrong, some people say, oh, how could you talk that way about your wife? Let me tell you something. My wife is so spoiled. I give her a big check every month that, so she can. Uh, she has it really good, okay? I wish things were the other way around. Um, anyways, the first thing that intellect does with an object is to class it with something else. Genius means little more than the faculty of perceiving in an unhabitual way. Genius is the capacity for seeing relationships where lesser men see none. Okay, uh, this is one by David Ogilvie, the advertising expert. He said, Conan Doyle wrote that mediocrity knows nothing higher than itself. My observation has been that mediocre men recognize genius they resented and feel compelled to destroy it. Yeah, I've run into that, and uh, it's bad. Uh, ben Franklin, genius is the ability to hold one's vision steady until it becomes reality. Yeah, often it'll take a couple of years to make something work. There are even decades. Okay, Francis Galton, a gifted man will achieve greatness if he can avoid constant professional toil for maintenance of a large family, domestic sours, anxieties, and petty cares. Yeah, and that's basically, Ezra Pound had said this too, about the only thing family members can do is just do busy work for you to free up your time. So in a sense, you make a deal with them um, that they'll do some of the busy work and you maybe pay them or something for it or do some favor for them. And in exchange, you get a little more time because that's been my frustration, you know. To be a doctor, you know, for like what I do probably takes an IQ of 130, 140 to do it well, but I got a lot of IQ beyond that, academic IQ at least, and I'm bored not to use it. So I like doing videos and writing books because it's a creative outlet. Um, okay, now here's a quote from Oliver Wendell Holmes. The world is always ready to receive talent with open arms. That's like your typical smart doctor. But very often it does not know what to do with a genius. Talent is a docile creature. It bows its head meekly while the world slips a collar over it. It draws its load cheerfully, and it is patient with the bit and the whip. But genius is always impatient of the harness. Its blood makes it hard to train. Talent is a very common family trait. Genius belongs rather to individuals. Talent is often to be envied and genius to be pitied commonly. Genius is a perpetual insult to mediocrity. It's every word is a trespass against someone else's vested ideas. I had that experience because I did my residency at Northwestern. I did that because of my mother. You know, I was from the Chicago area. My mother had cancer, so I wanted to stay close to where my mom was and help take care of her. We didn't, I didn't think she was going to live that long. And I really should have gone to Harvard. When I interviewed over there, they told me, just sign the sheet, we'll take you. And instead, I chose Northwestern, which I found Northwestern quite mediocre compared to my vision of Harvard. And so I was sort of, um, and I had some of the instructors, residency director, they kind of had an attitude towards me. Why are you so intense? Why are you such a workaholic? Why don't you just relax and enjoy life and, you know, learn your field, make your money, you'll have a good life. And they sort of like, instead of like appreciating me for being real gung-ho, they sort of uh, saw me as a little odd and they weren't that nice to me. I didn't like them. I actually traded all of my time at some of the fancy rich suburban hospitals, I traded them for going to the real poor hospital. So when I was a junior resident, I was doing real advanced like, you know, imaging guided surgery cases um, and other things. And I learned a lot more that way, but it was very much, no one else did that in the whole program, ever in the history of the program that I'm aware of. Uh, but that would that'd be like pretty typical of my personality. I always did whatever I thought would make me a better doctor. I really didn't care what some attending would say. I kind of had a very stuck up, arrogant attitude like, you know, this mediocre dumbass, I don't really give a rat's tail what he says. And that did not make me very popular, but I always knew I was right, so I did it. Um, like a typical thing is when I was an intern, they wanted me to give a presentation on something that I thought was boring, the head of the program. I refused, I just ignored them, and I did my presentation on something a lot more complex, and they gave me like a C, or, you know, like this poor evaluation for the rotation, and I just laughed at them. I was like, you petty scumbag, I could care less what you think. Okay, um, John Stuart Mill. Persons of genius are more individual than other people, less capable 
consequently of fitting themselves without hurtful compression into any small number of molds which society provides in order to save its members the trouble of forming their own character. Yeah, if you're going to become great at anything, you're going to have to be unique in that field, which means you're going to have to be different, nonconformist, which means that you're going to bump into some people that don't like the fact that you're nonconformist, but you have to take your pick. Do you want to be great or do you want to fit in more readily? You know, and uh, that's like if you ever read about John Boyd, you know, the book by Corman on him is real good. He sort of would say that to a lot of guys. He'd say, look, you take your pick. Either you go the conventional route, which will get you more promotions, probably more pay, or you decide to be great. And then you have to be non-conventional and you're going to run into some problems, but you'll do something great. So that, a lot of times it does come down to that. I hate to say it, but it does. If you're lucky enough to pick the right field where you can make money and simultaneously do great creative work, that's wonderful. But that's, that's hard to find. Okay, John Stuart Mill continues. People think genius a fine thing if it enables a man to write an exciting poem or paint a picture. But in the true sense, that of originality and thought and action, though no one says that it is not a thing to be admired, nearly all at heart think that they can very well do without it. Unhappily, this is too natural to be wondered at. Originality is the one thing which unoriginal minds cannot feel the use of. John Stuart Mill. And I see that in medicine. You know, I'm sort of like, there's no money for actually trying to cure a patient with low-fat vegan diet and all this other nutritional knowledge. So it's sort of like, there's remarkably little interest in it. There's remarkably little awareness in it. But once you've learned about it, it's like, how could you not care about it? It's like, holy crap, all these poor patients, you know, getting drugged and chopped up. We could actually really help them, maybe cure one of them for, you know, once in a, in a decade. Wouldn't that be nice? And don't get me wrong, most patients... They will choose. I can see it. In my experience, 99% of the time, people choose the wrong uh, approach. Coronary heart disease. You take the Alcestin diet, you're like cured 99.9% .9 of you, but almost no one makes that choice. And it's like that for a lot of other things, hypertension, etc. Okay, Ludwig van Mises. He, he's got some good quotes on geniuses. Innovators and creative geniuses cannot be reared in schools. They are precisely the men who defy what the school has taught them. Education rears disciples, imitators, routinists, not pioneers of new ideas and creative geniuses. The schools are not nurseries of progress and improvement, but conservatories of tradition and unvarying modes of thought. Society cannot contribute anything to the breeding and growing of genius men. A creative genius cannot be trained. There are no schools for creativeness. A genius is precisely a man who defies all schools and all rules who deviates from the traditional roads of routine of the routine and who opens up new paths through land inaccessible before. A genius is always a teacher. He is always self-made. The first thing a genius needs is to breathe free air. Yeah, when somebody's smart, let them work on their own. They're going to be happy to work. They're usually workaholics. Uh, okay, next, Raymond Moore. Recipe for genius. More of family, less of school. More of parents, less of peers. More of creative freedom and less of formal lessons. Yeah, if I could live my life over again and I was young, I would want to be homeschooled as much as possible and to just study on my own um, and then maybe find some like-minded kids and like-minded teachers to learn from. But gosh, I wouldn't want to waste my time and all the Mickey Mouse nonsense of uh, public schools where you just memorize something for a test and you forget it all. And I heard this other author, you know, William Glasser, the psychiatrist who had his own school, he said... Telling somebody to just memorize for something for a test that they know they're going to forget, that's like telling somebody to dig a ditch and then fill it back in with dirt. It's a waste of their time. Okay, Raymond Moore continues, There is not one replicated study that suggests little children should be in school at five or six years of age. Not even one. There is no replicated study that even suggests that a normal child should be in kindergarten. The home is the best garden for the child. The average home. And the time has come when we should be strengthening home instead of taking children out earlier. Raymond S. Moore from the author of Homegrown Kids. And I think what that's about is the sooner kids are put into a preschool or something, you get them away from their parents, you can turn them into atheists, turn them into materialists, and you could really then turn them into chumps. Okay, John Malloy. Uh, he's a guy I talked about earlier who wrote about dress for success and how to outwork the competition, things like that. He says, you have to risk being laughed at. People everywhere laugh at geniuses. And you have to face the fact that even if you make a breakthrough, it may cost you your credentials, your credibility, and your career. Risk-taking is an essential part of creativity. Yeah, I can tell you, like I said, you know, I've uh, had, you know, my wife, she's like, why the hell 
Would you be reading a biochemistry textbook? What, what good is that going to do you? Um, but yet you know in your own mind, I have to read this biochemistry book if I'm going to understand this other thing. There's no way around it. Okay, John Malloy, creative persons have learned from experience the world does not understand them. They learn to no longer expect to be understood. Okay, Ogilvy, there are very few men of genius in advertising agencies, but we need all that we can find. Most of them, without exception, are disagreeable. Don't destroy them. They lay golden eggs. Yeah, the so-called, most of the really brilliant people have been arrogant and they're real sort of obsessive and intense. And, you know, people say, oh, well, that's not a team player. Well, you know what? you got to let them be their idiosyncratic selves or you miss out on their other abilities. Edgar Allan Poe, the true genius shudders at incompleteness. Yeah, when they know something can be easily made better, they want to make it better. Paul Rousseau says, monomania can develop into genius as the individual delves deeper into the process, leaving normal parameters behind. Okay, David Ogilvy about the advertising. So his book was Confessions of an Advertising Man. It's a pretty good book. He says, few of the great creators have bland personalities. They are cantankerous egoists, the kind of men who are unwelcome in the modern corporation. Yep, that is true. Okay, uh, Oscar Wilde, genius lasts longer than beauty. When Oscar Wilde was traveling and they asked him a custom, do you have anything to declare? He said, I have only to declare my genius. Oscar Wilde continues, ridicule is a tribute paid to geniuses by mediocrities. Okay, here it is. I have nothing to declare about my genius. Maxim Gorky had a one good quote. He says, the higher goal a person pursues, the quicker his ability develops. Yeah, if you're aspiring to be somebody like somebody who's really great, that pushes you to, to work harder. Uh, so it's good to have high goals. Even you, know, you have to believe that they're remotely at least possible, but it's good to have high goals. Okay, now here is Charles Murray talking about development of genius. The first impulse was to think that the Latka curve of genius achievement really just represents the right-hand tail of a normal distribution. The right-hand tail of a normal distribution is not nearly as skewed as the Latka curve. Something else must be at work. The earliest and most commonsensical explanation for the something else is that the source of great accomplishment is multidimensional. It does not appear to be just because the person is highly intelligent or highly creative or highly anything else. Several traits have to appear in combination. I think that's a key point. They have to appear in combination. The pioneer of this view was a British polymath, Francis Galton, in the late 1800s, even though he had been instrumental in creating the modern concept of intelligence. Galton argued that intelligence alone was not, not enough to explain genius. Rather, he appealed to the concrete triple event of ability combined with zeal and capacity for hard labor. I think that's a great point right there. There's lots of people with high IQs. Most of them can give a rat's tail about ever achieving or discovering anything. I would say that's 99% of them, okay? But they are usually hard workers. Like I said, there's no lazy doctors. If you're, if you're lazy as a doctor, you'll get fired. Everyone will be pissed off at you because there's so much work to do. Uh, but there's plenty of stupid doctors. Um, and then they have to have a zeal for their area. So that's why I think religious people are often the best achievers because, for example, why did I get so great at biochemistry? I was like about the best biochemistry student in the whole United States for amongst medical students when I was in medical school was because in my view of the world at that time, I, I and I still agree with this, Biochemistry is the language in which God writes the book of life. And if I want to be a great doctor or scientist in a biological field, I have to get good at biochemistry. And I thought it was just incredible. It was so far beyond human chemistry because I had considered it previously being an organic synthetic chemist. And I'm like, wow, the biochemistry happening in the human body, it's like a million times more complicated and fascinating than synthetic organic chemistry. So I was just in awe of it. And that helped me to learn it. Okay, here's a quote by Nietzsche. Make the development of yourself the creation of a work of art. You must be objective to see the flaws in the early versions of a work so that you can recognize and correct them. If an artist is not able to recognize and fix his early flaws, then nothing good can be created. So what that means, if you're a young person and you have a mentor, you have to let yourself be criticized. You need to be open to constructive criticism because you're going to hear some insulting things and unless you learn from them, you can't, get, you can't improve. And I had the experience, for example, when I wrote some early books. You know, my first couple of books I wrote were for publishers. So they would give me some guidance. And it was mostly like follow all the rules, which didn't really teach me that much. But then I wrote some other books self-published. And I have a bunch of friends who were writing as a big part of their job for a living. They're like lawyers and stuff. And they gave me feedback. And they really criticized my writing. But that was very good for me because 
I saw that they were right, and then I realized I was going to improve. Because what you learn in college, you know, I got an A in my writing class at Stanford, they just teach you how to, you know, be concise. They don't really teach you how to write well. That comes from a lot of additional study. Okay, Nietzsche continues. Someone who has completely lost his way in a forest, but strives with uncommon energy to get out of it in whatever direction, will sometimes discover a new unknown way. This is how geniuses come into being, and they are then praised for their originality. Okay, this is the last uh, slide. And I thought that was a good quote by Nietzsche. Uh, okay, it was a desperation of trying for me to, to sort of fix my life that I read, you know, thousands of books on, on all these things all together when you get done with it, on learning how to write, learning the philosophy, learning academics, learning study skills, learning thinking skills, the biographies of all these geniuses and composers and stuff. Okay, um, university professors learn, okay, now this is Schopenhauer with a big rant on how, Schopenhauer is like the greatest philosopher that ever worked in Germany, and he was pissed off because the university wouldn't hire him as a philosopher. So basically, they, uh, they wanted a conventional person, and I see that sometimes in medicine, you know, though somebody who's just going to prescribe drugs for chronic diseases can make tons of money and, and have all the work they want, and if somebody comes along and tries to teach plant-based diet, you won't get paid, you won't get hired. And then look at all these great, you know, nutrition field researchers, guys like T. Colin Campbell, they tried to fire him. Uh, Caldwell Esselstyn, they wouldn't let him work there at his place, at, you know, at the Cleveland Clinic for a while. And McDougal, no one would send him a patient. That's kind of how it is when somebody does something unconventional, even though it might be 10 times better. Okay, so here's Arthur Schopenhauer's sort of rant about what it's like for a genius. Um... You know, they can't even get a job in their own field sometimes. University professors learn not for the sake of knowledge and insight, but to be able to chatter and give themselves airs. University professors, restricted in this way, are quite happy about the matter, for their real concern is to earn with credit an honest livelihood, to make money for themselves and also for their wives and children, and moreover, to enjoy a certain prestige in the eyes of the public. On the other hand, the deeply stirred mind of a real philosopher like Schopenhauer, whose whole concern is to look for the key of our existence, as mysterious and as precarious as it is, is regarded by these university professors as almost something mythological. Indeed, such a man, so affected, appears to the professors to be obsessed by a monomania. For that a man could really be in dead earnest about philosophy, it does not as a rule occur to anyone least of all to a lecturer thereon about philosophy. It has therefore been one of the rarest events, one of the rarest events for a genuine philosopher to be at the same time actually a lecturer in philosophy. Okay, so that's a great quote. Basically, if you really want to do philosophy, you can't get hired as a philosophy professor. And it might be the same thing, let's say, if you really want to cure chronic diseases with plant-based diets, you can't get hired as a doctor, <laughs> okay? Uh, you're probably gonna have to go start your own business. Okay, now Schopenhauer is talking about the real aristocratic genius. This guy Schopenhauer was so smart, he taught himself to read in a whole bunch of languages, something like at least four languages. I think it's more than that. Um, and he, kinda, he was wealthy, so he had inherited wealth, so he had plenty of time to study. Um, and he ended up not having any kids either. So you got a lot of time on your hands. You're not married, you don't have any kids, and you got inherited money, you know. That's why he was so prolific. Okay, no difference in rank, position, or birth is so great as the gulf that separates the countless millions who use their head only in service of their belly. In other words, they look upon it as an instrument of the will. And those very few and very rare persons who have the courage to say, no, my brain is too good for that. My brain shall be active only in its own service. It shall try to comprehend the wondrous and varied spectacle of the world and then reproduce it in some form, whether as art or as literature that may answer to my character as an individual. These are the truly noble, the real noblesse of the world. The others are serfs who go with the soil. The man endowed with great mental gifts leads apart from the individual life that is common to all. He leads a second life purely of the intellect and he devotes himself to the constant increase, rectification and extension, not of mere learning, but of real systemic knowledge and insight. It is thus a life which raises a man and sets him above fate and its changes. Always thinking, learning, experimenting, practicing his knowledge, the man soon comes to look upon this second life as the chief mode of his existence and his merely personal life as something subordinate, 
seeing only to advance ends higher than itself. An example of this independent, separate existence is furnished by Goethe, Johann von Wolfgang Goethe. Okay, and this is Arthur Schopenhauer, who lived from 1788 to 1860. So I think that's kind of awesome, and I, and, I, and I totally resonate with that feeling, that basically when you're fascinated with trying to understand something, whatever it might be, weight loss, obesity, hypertension, diabetes, cancer, autoimmune disease, etc., it's a very fascinating thing to, to really study all the papers on that that you can and study it. And that's really like what I feel like I should be doing. I really would love to have a research job where I could just do that every day. Whereas I work as a clinical doctor about five days a week and then I'll do this other stuff, you know, about a day on the week on a, as a hobby, but I can only do so much with only about one, one and a half days a week devoted to it. But I think it's great stuff. You know, I searched, I studied like everything I could in medicine. It turns out all this diet and toxicology is the most powerful stuff and it's fascinating. So anyways, you know, you only have so much time in this world and you do the best you can with what you got. So anyways, I hope that was interesting.